Hey everybody, I'm Jake. And I'm Nicole. And tiny houses have become a lot of the rage, especially with a younger generation of people. They come in different shapes and forms, and one of these tiny houses is a yurt. And Nicole and I have decided to take our lives uh, very remote into the Canadian rainforest. Some would say the Canadian jungle. <laughs> and we live in a yurt. Yes. We've been living in the yurt now for almost three years, so we have a lot of new people that are following our journey here on YouTube, and they follow our weekly show we put out about our off-grid life. And we thought we'd give you guys a, a full video that just shows you where we are right now and what it's like to live in a yurt three years in. So full yurt tour, full garden tour, kind of full property tour. Yeah, so this is where we started. <laughs> when we first got here, we weren't able to get into our property at all. It was thick with trees. Literally we, this, this is our property as well. Yeah. This is what we were faced with. There was, yeah. there was no home site. And we filmed it, so if you guys want to see that, it's uh, the video is called Starting Over. Our property was logged about 40 years ago, so it's it was very challenging to even get into our property, but we've made like amazing progress on our property in the last almost three years. So. I think we made amazing progress. You made amazing progress. Yeah. We have almost 20 acres here, so a lot of our property has not even been touched by us, and we like that. We're gonna to try to leave it as natural uh, and at one with nature as possible. How much land do you think we've been, what, it's like? We've probably been living acres? on, I would say, two or less acres. Yeah. What's cool about our YouTube show is that in every title, we put an episode number. So you can see episode 135, episode 20. You can go back and see our whole journey from starting over with Jake and Nicole day one. And the way that logging works is they clear cut areas. So you gotta think about our 20 acres being clear cut back in the late 80s or early 90s. And when loggers are finished, they take all the choice logs out, but they leave behind giant piles of debris and mismatched logs that become big piles of Hugo culture mulch compost. So today, 40 years later, if Nicole and I just go for a hike in our property, it's possible that Nicole can fall right up to her neck in one of these mulchy pits that's Which now Which I like, have before. Yeah. yeah. So it's very challenging where we have decided to live, but there's also a million incredible reasons to live where we live. Let's go give you guys a tour of Como Rebbe in year three. Hey, why are you fidgeting so much? There's mosquitoes everywhere. <laughs> um, so here's our beautiful green yurt. It's a 30 foot diameter yurt. It's an open floor plan, like a studio apartment. So let's go check it out. Here we have Puma and his brother Kai. Come on, let's go show him. As you can see, it's very open in here. We uh, left it that way. We really liked the open feel of it, especially with the dome. Um, I don't even know if the camera can really capture how beautiful and open it is. A lot of people say when they first walk in, that's where their eye goes, is like straight up to this beautiful um, open floor plan ceiling. <laughs> okay, so we'll start back here, which is probably one of my favorite spots of the year, finally, um, is our living room. I've had maybe like five or six different types of living rooms, if you guys have been following our journey. Um, this one I think is gonna be final. This is our first couch. We've never really had a couch. I've made couches <laughs> out of pallets, um, but this couch I really like a lot because we have some storage underneath here, which is really nice. And then it also, this part pulls out into a, like a bed or a big sofa. And then we have this really nice coffee table that also pulls up and we have storage underneath. We don't have a whole lot of storage here, so the extra storage is really nice. Would you say that you like this new couch? Yeah, I would say I do. We were really against having a sofa at first. We want to just a meditation area with cushions like the one we got in India here. Yeah, like this one. But it's just, it's... we've three years later, we realized that, you know, our bodies are working hard and this sofa is such a luxury. Yeah, it is very nice. Anyway. And it's the same color as Kai. Yeah, apparently we like blue. Blue dogs, blue couch. But what folks don't realize is that we get close to 20 feet of rain per year. This is like almost a rainier place than Hawaii. So what keeps your stuff in these storage areas dried out? Um, our wood stove. 
So since it's the summertime right now, we're not using the wood stove, so it just kind of sits here and still looks really pretty. I can't wait to fire this bad boy up in the fall. It really makes the space come alive. Since this really is a rainforest, the yurt can get pretty moist feeling, so. It does, yeah. And since we don't have like a plug-in dehumidifier, this thing really dries everything out and just, it's very nice. And then right next to it, we have a drying rack um, that we built maybe a couple years ago. Um, we have bamboo trays in them. If you guys have seen me dehydrate a bunch of herbs, I'll put them on this. I'll take the herbs. If the fire's going, then I'll place them right here. I'll turn the fans so then the fans blow the heat and then it dries out my herbs. I have three um, slots, I guess you'd say. <laughs> right here and here. Quite amazing. I love this drying rack so much. We have our wood that we store underneath it. Um, and I love these bamboo uh, trays as well. They're really nice. So. Can you show us, what are these fans called? These fans are eco fans. Um, they don't run on battery or nothing. You don't have to plug them in. They are operated by heat. So the heat touches the bottom and then it starts the, the, the fan. Um, and they're great because then it heats up the whole area. Like the heat doesn't stay here. The fans help make it travel throughout the yurt or to the drying rack. <laughs> okay, so right now we are underneath the loft. This actually used to be Jake and I's bedroom. Um, we turned it into the dog area and then also I kind of have like my little art studio over there. We just got this awesome dog kennel for the dogs. It says Puma and Kai on it. It's made of all wood and a handmade cushion and it's adorable and I love it so much. Um, I think Kai's already in there. Good boy. Go in there. Go kennel all the way. Kennel all the way. There you go. And then stay, stay. They have this cute little door <laughs> that shuts and it latches closed, so if we go into town or something and we need them to be safe in here, they have a nice little comfy spot. And then in the winter time, they'll keep each other warm. It's really spacious and big. Kai is always in this, like, he is so funny. He's like a prince, like, he's just like all sprawled out on his cushion, it's hilarious. But I love how it says their name. On the top, we can use it for shelving. It's just really nice. And as you guys can see that we're using the underneath of the loft as a drying station. We don't have a barn, so it stays really dry underneath here. So this is garlic from our garden that we're drying out. Um, this is my first time ever drying out garlic, so we'll see how it turns out. We also have some herbs over here from the garden. Um, you have, we have eucalyptus, lavender, some different types of lavender, rosemary. Um, Those yeah. look great, like a little witch's apothecary. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, and then we have just like a little art studio over here. And then we have our closet over in this area. It's kind of like a little private room. Room divider. This is how we keep it separate to have our closet and to change and whatnot. And then if you just pan over here, we have the ladder going up to our loft. Our loft, we use as storage now for food and, you know, boxes and knickknacks and stuff like that. And then over here is kind of like our office area, I guess. The tech station. The tech station, yeah. We have... All of our cords and wires, extra camera, batteries, and stuff like that. Plus our shoe rack, and then we are back here at the front door. And we have a refrigerator now. So we haven't had a refrigerator for maybe almost three years. We just got this like a couple of months ago, and it's been amazing. <laughs> it's really great because we are powering it by the sun. We have this Blue Eddy battery, which I'm not sure the specs on it. It's an EV240. It's an EV240, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so we use this, we will take it outside, charge it with the sun, bring it back in, and it powers this fridge. It's a low energy fridge and it works amazing. It's really great. It is small, but it's okay because we didn't have a refrigerator for a long time, so I'll take anything right now. We're able to decorate it with all of our magnets from when we traveled around the world, so it's cool to finally display those. Jake and I have traveled to over 15 different countries. We actually video blogged it um, on our YouTube channel, which you guys can totally check out. Now we're moving into the kitchen. We have our sink and our hand pump. Um, so you just kind of pump it like this to get the water. Where does that water come from? It comes from an IVC tote that's on the other side of the deck over there that is collecting rainwater. So all this is rainwater. We have our compost bucket here. We have a second compost bucket down here. And when the wood stove isn't going during the winter, or the fall, we use our propane gas cooktop. Um, we also have lots of outdoor cooking with a flame. A ton, I mean, ton. if you guys have been watching our journey, we are always outside cooking with the pizza oven and the wok stove all the time. 
Here's our kitchen countertops. We made and milled all of this ourselves. We really liked the idea of having open cupboards to where you can see everything. But you want me to mill and create some doors. <laughs> For the bottom shelves. Okay. Um, the top, I really like to leave that open. It's, I like it a lot. We get a lot of compliments on it, especially with the, the live wood that you can see on the edges. Um, it'd just be really nice to have doors for the down below, which we're working on. But this is also how we escaped having a fridge for a couple of years because a lot of our foods were eaten at the time, gathered, foraged, or dried. Yes, we have tons. I mean, just to point out a couple, we have our dried mushrooms from last year, dried chanterelles, angel wings. We also have rosemary and dill that I dried this year. I also made a ton of raspberry jam. Um, raspberry currant jams. I've been giving some away and we've been eating it. So this is kind of what we have left. It was just too good. So here's our dining room table where we eat or just put a lot of our stuff. Um, it's a table that I found made with recycled pallets and I absolutely love this table so much because you can also expand it. So when we're having a pizza party or if we have people over, you can just open it up. So. <laughs> Get it, Nicole. It's kind of tricky, but it's like that. And now it's one big open table. I love this table so much, and I hope that it stays in our family forever. <laughs> it's like my favorite. When Jake and I need to power stuff up, when we're hanging out on the couch, watching a movie or editing one of these vlogs, um, we have another Blue Eddy right here, um, which charges a lot of our gadgets. And this one. I'm not sure what the specs on this one is either. This one's called an AC200. An AC200. So we can charge stuff on top, charge all the stuff below, power this thing with the sun, so. And then right behind me, we have our very first shelf that Jake and I ever made when we first moved here. Um, I use this as my herb shelf now, holding books and tons of herbs that I've been harvesting from the property. Lemon balm, chocolate mint, plantain, raspberry leaves, hibiscus, rose hips. What do you mean raspberry leaves? What do you do there? I take the young leaves of the raspberry bush. You definitely want to take it before the raspberries start to come in. Um, so I just take a bunch of leaves. I'll either dehydrate it by the wood stove if that's going. If not, then I'll do it in front of the sun. Um, raspberry leaves. It's amazing tea, especially for women. Um, it helps with like menstrual cramps and so much more. It's just a really amazing plant. Um, so I have a ton of it here and I drink it like crazy. So There's a wall calendar of yourself. Yeah, we have a Komorebi calendar. So if you have one, that's awesome. If you don't have one, de definitely go check out our website um, and get one. We also have some cool t-shirts on there and sweatshirts and more to come. They love the new living room area. Um, and so now we're back into the living room. So as you can see, we just did a complete circle. The year is round. So Jake and I had our bedroom in here for two years, but this last spring we built a separate structure to where our bedroom is. So let's go check it out. So here is our bedroom, the bunkie, um, come on inside. So there's really not too much to say about our bedroom, it's just one small room with our bed. Um, we have our dresser, which is really nice, we have our uh, drawers on the side, and then this slides for extra uh, space. We have um, our nightstand right here, or I have a nightstand. Hey, it's so dark in here, where are the lights? We have one light here. Whoa. Does it change it in there? <laughs> the camera did not like that. Oh really? So just putting out some of our decor. Um, I made these picture frames, obviously not the frames themselves, but the flowers inside. I pressed these flowers last summer. And then if we just pan over here, we have two dream catchers 
that I made. Um, I really enjoy making dream catchers and especially if I find really cool feathers, I love incorporating them. Uh, I think this was the first dream catcher that I've ever made. And I think this was the recent one. And what are these flowers? They are dehydrated flowers from Shamrock Farms, which is like our favorite farm of all time. Now I'm on the other side of the bedroom, technically Jake's side of the bed. And we have our amazing cubic mini wood stove right here. When we first built this bunkie, it was towards the end of winter, early spring. So it wasn't too cold. So we only had to use this a couple of times, but when we did use it, it warmed the space up so well. What do you think? I think it's good. It's warm. And <laughs> I think my favorite thing about this oven is the cute little like fire tools. Like how adorable is this? <laughs> And the shovel. I mean, come on. How cute is that? And we also have the eco fan, or we have another eco fan on top, which heats the whole space up really well. We have a shelf over here with some more storage. I just put this together not too long ago, which is really nice. We have our window to the outside. And that's it. Honestly, that's our bedroom. A nice, cute little small space, nothing too big, which we don't really need. So. Behind you, I see something, a structure out there. What is that? Oh, that is the chapel, which is our bathroom. We call it a chapel because it kind of looks like a chapel. Um, but that is our toilet. Would you like to go see it? Hey, this area out here looks very cute. Yeah, we have um, a little herb garden, a kitchen garden, I guess, right here in the front. We have our amazing chofu tub, which I guess I'd go show you guys. This is a chofu. Um, it's like a wood stove that heats up water. I don't know the proper terminology, <laughs> but you make the fire in here and then you have two pipings that take the water and filter it through it, heat the water up, and then voila, you have a nice warm hot tub. My fiance is telling me it's called thermo siphoning. Perfect. Um, and it also looks like a choo-choo train, so we always call it the train, especially when there's a fire going and the smoke is coming out this. It's like definitely a choo-choo train. It's hilarious. So we just have the cold that goes in and then the hot that goes out. But let's go check out the composting toilet. Here we have our shower. We actually just put a video out of three years of our shower evolution, I guess you'd say. Um, we went through many different showers, so here's what our shower looks like now. We actually have a roof and walls, which is really nice. So here is our chapel, AKA the composting toilet. I won't show you guys too much of it. Pretty self-explanatory, I guess. Um, so we have our toilet paper, toilet, and when we're done using the bathroom, um, how a composting toilet works is you put the wood shavings in afterwards and that's it, bada boom. Also over here, we have jumbo incense because during the summer, the spring and the summer we have mosquitoes so we light these which kind of helps keep the mosquitoes away and that's it so our, our toilet why the white bucket the white bucket oh this holds um all of our toilet paper we have a ton of toilet paper in here there's also a lot of mice around here so if we just left our toilet paper sitting out the mice would destroy it um to make their like beds so and we also keep it in here too because if we left it out it get really wet and moist and, and damp. So keeping it in here helps keep it dry. This is like my life for the next couple months. If we don't get all the firewood put away by like August, September, then it just will not dry out. Snow is not really our issue here, it's the dampness. And not only does the wood keep us warm in the winter, uh, we usually need about eight to 10 cords, but it also is what we cook with 99% of the time. The wood stove cooking in the yurt 
and then I'll show you guys our two main um, outdoor cooking accessories. Last year we did, I think it was like a 10 or 11 part series where Nicole and I together built uh, a pizza oven out of brick, glass bottles, and cob, which is clay, straw, and sand. And it's been working great. We haven't finished it yet, actually. There was gonna be a aesthetically artistic layer on the outside, so we still got about three or four more inches to go, but this is in perfect working order. And uh, you guys have watched us along the way on this journey, cooking our pizza and our quiche and our breads. Pies. Pies. Nicole just made the best pie I've ever had. Cookies, cinnamon rolls, things like that, so. We'll have this whole shelf filled up with firewood to cook with all winter long. And uh, behind it, you guys saw when uh, Nicole was out of town this last time, she went to visit her family. Uh, I built up a trellis, which is pretty strong, and um, it's growing kiwi of many different varieties. And now the kiwi have reached the top and they're starting to kind of enclose the top of this. I don't know, I've always wanted to have just kiwis dropping down, and where we live is one of the few places in the world that can grow kiwis really easily. So, got about six varieties, I think two or three male plants, and then probably about seven female plants. That's it, kiwi. So come back next year this time, and these new plants will be fruiting like crazy. Okay, let's go check out the wok stove. Um, people that haven't watched the pizza oven series, the cooking goes on in here. This is just to store firewood. <laughs> Had a lot of comments saying, what's the bottom part cook? It doesn't. That's firewood storage. This is the cooking dome. Go back and watch the series. You'll find out. Okay, the wok stove we've done a lot of times. This is traditional Chinese style cooking inspired by my college days, majoring in Asian studies. I've trained um, Shaolin style Kung Fu my whole life and been to China over 10 times. I just do love the history of Chinese culture and food and I, uh, I've always wanted to have a flame powered wok outside to cook those Chinese dishes, uh, steam things like baozi and jiaozi and make like stir mongoli, fries. Stir fry. <laughs> yeah. So it's not going right now. It's not dinner time yet, but uh, Nicole and I have shown you guys a ton of times. We built the entire wok stove with you here on the Jake and Nicole channel, so check it out. Go back and just type in Jake and Nicole wok stove. The wok is where all the cooking happens. The bamboo steamers is how we steam it. And then if you walk around this side, I'll show you. You can see ginseng catching some rays here, afternoon rays on the new floor. But uh, if you want to play the role of the Chinese grandma, you just uh, sit down and then while the kids cook the meal. Grandma feeds the fire. And we got all the wood down here. Uh, feed it, keep it just the right temperature. You can uh, thank Nicole for the Southwest Mexican style influence on all the tiling here. It's really good. I think it adds so much pretty color. It's so bright. And it's important to us because we met in the Sonoran Desert in Arizona and um, our life's journey began there close to Mexico. And that was the first country Nicole ever went to outside of uh, the States was Mexico. Yeah. Okay, I'll take you guys to go see the garden. Nicole and I have really um, loved gardening since we've gotten together. We actually got together through gardening. She attended one of my gardening workshops back in the day where we met for the first time. And uh, we just haven't been able to garden very much since day one because as you saw in the beginning of this video, the property was so difficult to just cut into. There was so much needing to be done for basic amenities and infrastructure, the yurt, the bathroom. It took so long to build these things because of the landscape is so tumultuous. So now we're just starting to garden like we've wanted to garden this whole time. And we've uh, picked up a skill of chainsaw milling. So we do chainsaw mill our own wood. If we drop a tree, um, we drop a tree to allow more airflow and light to come into an area. And when the tree drops, we mill it to give us lumber for all these projects. Got the archway here we'll keep working on got some jasmine and now we can walk outside barefoot and we can actually walk all the way to the garden because we milled a raised pathway. I was inspired by a lot of hiking 
that we've done in Hawaii. A lot of times when you go hike in Hawaii, it's so wet and the landscape is so sacred that they don't want to have a lot of tourists coming through all the time, trampling the plant life down and compacting the fertile topsoil. So they have a lot of hikes um, made up of walkways so that everyone kind of walks on boards that help to protect the surrounding landscape. So I was inspired by that and I'm like, let's do that here. So instead of walking on all the remnants of the logging, you can see this whole area used to be a logging site. There's down trees, there's trees growing from trees, there's percolation pits that have been dug and, and then they come in after it's logged and uh, Canadian tree planters, usually young people, over plant trees again, little saplings. And in this area it was hemlock. So then they're too close together and it's just way too thick. So we're trying to bring some more natural balance to the forest and be at one with the nature that surrounds us. We get inspiration to do that when we go walk into the old growth because the old growth does have that more balanced feel. And now instead of dropping into pits of logging, we're kind of walking above on the deck. It also just feels a little more secure from bears and cougars to be above, doesn't it? Yeah, it feels really nice. And then when I jump off the deck, you guys are gonna see uh, that I'm kind of on this cushy pile of wood chips. So eventually we're gonna have big piles of wood chips all over so that we're putting any kind of like sticks and debris we've cut back into the landscape in the form of wood chips. Gardening, we're doing raised beds because not only are bears and cougars alpha predators, but the plant life, the native plant life here is an alpha predator. Mosquitoes are also alpha predators. But the plant life is, is vigorous. And so if we were to put a garden in the ground, um, it would quickly be taken over by salal, salmon berries, and a lot of other thistles and um, native weeds. So I think it's really important to get out into the world and see how different cultures garden. And Nicole and I did this in Portugal and Spain and France. And every one of those countries that we woofed for, they had weed problems. So I told myself, we're not gonna have weed problems, hence milling these raised beds. So like for the carrot bed here, the bottom half of the soil is all wood chips and rotted logs. And then the top half is all compost. And then over the years, the rotted logs and wood chips will become fertile compost as well. And we'll have incredible soil in these beds. But right now we have carrots just uh, getting to be like adolescent stage. We've got over here, some different varieties of beets. Wow, I can see beets from, look at this guy. He's like a little half dollar size beet. See him? This bed over here, newly planted because uh, it was garlic. You guys saw that Nicole is dehydrating that inside. So we replanted some uh, lettuces and bok choys. The little black bok choys up there are really Incredible and that black coloring is so nutritious those anthocyanins. Okay, some of the beds that are ready right now is uh, Behind me So a lot of bok choys. I think bok choy is so incredible and again I'm inspired by my life so far and I, every time I've gone to China Especially if you get out of Shanghai or Beijing and you go to these smaller cities The people there that don't have much money they feed themselves by growing food everywhere And so if you go for a walk in a place like I was in uh, Guilin for example. And everywhere that I rode my bike in Guilin, I would see bok choy and Chinese lettuces growing next to the paths. So I've always thought that bok choy is like a sacred green. It's nutritious and it just, it's so cute. Like look at these guys. Baby bok choy is looking so nice. Adding this to all of our stir fries and um, our smoothies in the morning. We got two different varieties. And then if uh, we pan to the middle, we can see all the herbs. We've got lavenders and rosemary and honeysuckle and sage. And then behind, we've got the garden arch that we're gonna turn into like um, a structure for hanging uh, planters coming up. For now, it just makes us feel real good. <laughs> and then we got uh, our kimchi ingredients coming along here. We got the, the Napa cabbages that we're gonna let these guys get a little bigger. These Chinese style cabbages and then we'll cut them for kimchi. We'd love to ferment that kimchi and then you can actually keep that for quite a while. And broccoli. So we've been harvesting the broccoli as it's been coming up and uh, this one's ready to go. So you can eat the leaves and the heads and then back here we're hoping that we'll get some Brussels sprouts going on maybe uh, in the fall when they're ready to go. But if you guys pan to the left you'll see more garden. 
We've got um, a lot planted there and 40 tomato plants. So let me show you. Before we check that out, we got uh, just some experiments, like some in-ground stuff we're trying. Um, so I talk about weeds, but I wanted to see what would happen. So I took this area, logged it off, and planted directly in the earth some uh, ground cherries, also called Fisalis. And they're doing pretty well so far, but look at all the weeds already starting to come in. So I'm constantly kind of adding my gardener's shadow to this and pulling the weeds up. Lemon balm grows really well in the native landscape. Uh, this becomes a pond in the winter time behind me. So I planted a lot of mint down in there and we have uh, wild watercress and skunk cabbage, which we can use the root from. And then over here, we got the herb bed. We got onions, garlic chives, oregano, cilantro, dill, lemon verbena, arugula, and we're trying to see if we can get some basil, even though it seems like the slugs and the birds like it as much as we do, so it's not big yet. Yeah. But the dill's looking really good, so if we get uh, our cucumbers going on, we can make some nice dill pickles. Mm. Now I'm like nice and fresh for a nice kiss. We also have our scarecrow. This is turnip head with our CD disc to scare away the birds. Turnip head? <laughs> That added you as a Miyazaki fan. Yeah. But it's been working, right? The robins like disappeared overnight. Yeah, it's been great. I mean, they still come in every once in a while, but it's been a lot better. And then if you're right there, when I uh, want to get out of here, I just now walk up and see you. Bye. Wait, what about the tomatoes? Oh yeah, let's go see. You guys saw the first thing we did when we got to Como Rebi was we had to cut our way in. And then we lived in our white van we call the spirit bear. A spirit bear is an albino uh, bear. So our van is white, so it's the spirit bear. And we built this carport. So the carport was the first structure that we built to get us out of the rain. And um, at the time, that was a huge win, don't you think? Yes. It was also our kitchen and right. <laughs> it's like everything for us. So now we turned it into a barn, or we're turning it into a barn. We're gonna have sliding barnyard doors on it, but we finished this wall first. We milled the wood on the outside here and we're gonna use this as a trellis to grow some grapes up here eventually. And then we already started growing sugar snap peas or sweet peas on this one. And they're just about to reach the trellis. Oh, sweet pea, come on and dance with me. And then if we come this way, we've got the Jerusalem artichokes, different colors, purple and white, or sunchokes, or people in this area call them artichokes. And uh, we got blueberries going on, so this guy's starting to ripen now. Here we go. This one is not full, but it's, uh, it's edible. Here you go. Thank you. So blueberries and strawberries together, but we also planted, look, more Fisalis ground cherry. And these ones are about twice the size in the raised beds as they are in the ground. Maybe because they don't have any weed competition. <laughs> so these will put off um, a really delicious orange berry that's in a husk, like an orange tomatillo. Strawberries ripening all the time. And then we planted these two long narrow beds as tomato beds. When the pandemic hit and COVID hit, Nicole and I got really scared actually, because we were, um, we went into town to get some supplies and all the shelves were bare. And we had been off the grid already at that time for almost like two years. We felt pretty good. We had water, we had food, we know how to catch stuff from the ocean, we know how to forage stuff on the land. But it's still nice if you ever are in town to get some you know, supplies and they were gone. So we started thinking, hey, let's grow the garden now. And we did a lot of our garden growing in tires. So we only had about four tomato plants last year in tires. They fruited, they did okay. So this year we wanted to have an abundance. So we got 20 tomato plants in each bed, 40 total that are being staked and I'm pinching crotches and center staking them. We also are doing some eggplant and they're looking pretty good. This eggplant is putting off its flowers now and uh, should be having eggplants, I'm guessing, in about, you know, three weeks. But the tomatoes over here are one month behind the tomatoes over here. So this one is doing really well. And I've now started to let the flowers go because I feel like the plant is an appropriate size and are just loaded up with flowers like this one that are now growing into tomatoes down here. 
I do like to bonsai my fruit trees and bonsai my tomato plants, so I have really enjoyed this tomato section and if you guys have followed me for gardening, whenever I touch a tomato plant, it reminds me of my grandmother's house in Huntsville, Alabama. I don't know, it just triggers that memory. But look at how they're looking good. I don't mean to brag, but I think they're looking pretty good. These ones are actually doing really well on the edge. And they're just like loaded with tomatoes here. I like these purple ones. Thank you too. Pan up and you'll see there's like a dozen more coming right here. Flowers everywhere. So right now I think we have about one month to go and honestly it's very uncharacteristically sunny and warm for this part of the world so it's, it's meaning a really nice tomato crop. Come on, let's go. So the garden is fun, but I really believe in the power of fruit trees, but also wild foods and native foods. So if you see behind me, you know, this is a lot of our acreage back here and we've been clearing this one section for the fruit tree orchard. And so far we've put 40 fruit trees in the ground, different varieties, a lot of apples, a lot of cherries, um, a lot of hazelnuts and walnuts, and even some more exotics like um, behind. This one's really great. It's a Chinese peppercorn tree that is very spiky like a rose, but actually grows peppercorns. So we can actually have our own spices and things like that. And then little beds next door, like this is a, a native black cap raspberry that we found in the wild landscape. We took some pups off of it and now we're growing it a few feet down the road here in the garden. So we love the thimble berries, the salmon berries, the black caps, the salal, the blackberries, and we're trying to you know, cultivate those natives around. Because natives are powerful. If you're in an area, you should know what 10 foods you can eat right now in season. And for us, we do, but we also have the ocean. So if you are inclined for mussels and clams and oysters, prawn, crab, and fish, seaweed, sea asparagus, it's all out there. Abundance. So stay tuned to next year. 2022 will be a great year for us here because you're gonna see the yurt change a lot. We're gonna actually give it an exoskeleton. <laughs> we're gonna give it a mega roof and an exoskeleton. Uh, we're gonna reinforce it with cob and we're gonna also be able to eat the fruit from our fruit trees. Um, and if you wanna see how much food we're gonna harvest in the landscape here, you're gonna to wanna to see what happens to these fruit trees out there. So if you see the chaos that is behind me, it's not always gonna look like that. You're gonna see pathways and wood chips and just a really cute Pinterest type Thomas Kincaid painting coming up. So stay tuned. So now we're inside the carport and it's turned into the workbench. I've learned something about, you know, male roles and female roles with this adventure. And I've learned that, you know, I am a guy. I am strong and I have good endurance and I can, I could go all day on a project and I can go, go, go. And my brain works very singularly. I can like focus on one project and dominate that project and get it done like a guy, you know? But I've noticed that if Nicole's not here, the rest of my life goes into chaos. And the projects that I complete are very uh, basic and they're kind of like scientific with no life. And I found that with this adventure, when I have my Nicole partner, who's a woman, she brings organization and beauty into the other parts of my life. And when we do projects together, the artistic, beautiful side of the project kind of is that yin, that woman. And then the, the beast mode singular focus is the man. So I, I really have learned a lot about life and myself. I don't think men are stronger than women. I don't think women are stronger than men. I think both are 50% pieces of the pie, you know? Yin and yang, light, dark, cold, hot. So I really have respected um, how Nicole and I work together in this whole thing. Case in point, the workbench. Without Nicole, this would be an area of chaos all the time. And she kind of holds it together and keeps it organized so that we can both work to our, to our best and not spend all day trying to find things. But eventually we're gonna have a washer dryer here, also charged by solar panels on the roof. So please stay tuned to watch us put together um, a four to 10 kilowatt hour solar system. It's gonna really make life here very enjoyable with modern amenities, even though we're uh, off the electricity grid. This is where the garden was. Last year you guys saw us build 
if you follow the journey, it's also the sunniest spot of the property. So we're prepping all of our firewood in this spot. We have a big pile of firewood we put together over the last year. Uh, we're chopping it up and we're chopping it by hand, so it's a little more rough cut than the precise wood splitter you see a lot of people use nowadays. We're doing it by hand. And we make it into towers. And uh, these towers will sit out in the sun, dry for about another week, and then we'll throw all these into the woodshed and we'll fill them again. So we'll keep kind of cycling through cover them with tarps on rainy days, reveal them on sunny days. And by first week of September, we should have all of our firewood away for the entire winter. Solar panels like this all over the property and next door is the compost. We got the twin bays for the compost. I've done so many composting videos for you guys. Not only do we take all of our food scraps and all of our uh, organic materials, put them in the compost and then add the wood ash from our fire, from our cooking wok stove, from our pizza oven and from our wood stove inside the yurt. Uh, we also add all the wood shavings. When we use the chainsaw, we save all those wood shavings, we put them in there. And the carbons and nitrogens combine together to make really healthy soil we can use about a year later. When we go to harvest it, we just take the slats away, take a shovel, scrape it all out, and then it's empty and we can fill it up again. You guys saw us build the red yurt over there. We call it the Galicia yurt. So we've got Komorebi and Galicia. If we have a guest or a caretaker or family, they can stay in the, uh, the guest yurt. And uh, we even have another well pump here that's on this property that, the good thing about these properties is that when they converted from logging properties to quote unquote residential properties, they had to put wells in them. So we've just put these large cast iron wells on each lot and we have a uh, fresh spring water that is like a 9.5 pH ready to drink. I don't know if you guys followed the journey from day one, but if you did, you might have seen Nicole and I had no access to water. We had to like put buckets out to gather rain. Well, now we've taken the carport roof, the yurt roof, and all the roofs we've put up, and we collect rainwater into these thousand liter IBC totes. And we use that. But we also have two wells. We have a well on this lot as well as well. And this one, uh, the wells are drilled to about 300 feet, but the static water level is about 40 feet. No, sorry, it's 20 feet. So we dropped our well down about 40 feet. And we're all hand powered, so we just kind of give it about four pumps. We went through the process of having the water tested. No bacteria, no uh, harmful minerals like arsenic a 9.5 pH. It's literally mountain spring water in the Canadian rainforest. You can drink. Right out of the tap. And this is how Nicole and I drink water. And it's cold. It's cold. It is delightful. I mean, honestly, it's free. There's no monthly service charge. Living off the grid with electricity and water and shelter. That's the goal.